morning and welcome to online worship. I am Leslie Anderson. I am your director of connections and I want to welcome you today. In just a few moments, Pastor Jason is going to bring a Bible story that you need to know. If you are in the Washington area, we would love to have you in person. We have services at 8, 15 and 10 a.m. every single Sunday. So join us anytime. But now let's prepare our hearts for the worship. Online Church starts right now. Hey everybody, so good to be with you today. If you're joining us for the first time, special welcome. My name is Jason Wolver. I'm the directing pastor here and it's so glad to have you with us today. So today we're continuing in this summer message series, Bible stories you need to know. And we're looking at these classic essential stories from the Gospel of Luke. And today we're in Luke chapter 19, verses one through 10. Hear this reading from God's word. It says, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him. For he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. And this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, I thank you for your goodness and your power and your love. So I pray that you would fill us with the love for the Lord Jesus, that you would open our hearts to hear from the word of God today, that you would convict us, challenge us, and maybe even save some of us from hell, from our sins, through faith and repentance. In Jesus' name, amen. So my mother, Carolyn Wooliver, was a huge fan of Bible songs. This little light of mine, Joshua fought the battle of Jericho, all those songs. But one of her favorites was this one. Sing it with me if you know it. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. But as the Savior passed his way, he looked up in that tree, and he said, Zacchaeus, You come down, for I'm coming to your house today, for I'm coming to your house today. I believe that made my mom smile. Thank you for indulging me. That's a great song, perhaps one of the easiest Bible stories to teach kids, because it's just such a vivid picture of this short little man scurrying up into a tree to see Jesus, and Jesus saying, you come down right now, because I'm going to your house. And the story of Zacchaeus is definitely a Bible story that we all need to know. And although the Bible song is helpful for getting initial exposure to it, there's really a lot more going on in this story than the song lets on. This is one of the most helpful stories in the Bible for understanding the mission of Jesus the Messiah and also for gaining a picture of what repentance truly looks like. So let's walk through this together. Verse one, he entered Jericho and was passing through. Now this is talking about Jesus passing through Jericho on his way to Jerusalem. A turning point in the gospel of Luke is chapter nine, verse 51, where it says, as the time approached for Jesus to be taken up to heaven, he resolutely set out for Jerusalem. This means that Jesus knew that things would be coming to a head for him very soon. He would go to Jerusalem 
for the Passover where he would be killed and be dead in the grave, but he would rise from the grave and ascend back to heaven, mission accomplished. And he knew all those things lay ahead and he embraced his destiny and started the fateful journey toward Jerusalem. And now we're in chapter 19 and he's very close. By the end of chapter 19, he will be arriving in Jerusalem for the Passover on a donkey's back, making a very public declaration that he is the Messiah that people have been waiting for. And so in order to get there, he's got to pass through this city of Jericho, which is about 18 miles away from Jerusalem. Now, Jericho is an ancient city. It's thought to be the oldest city on earth. And it was a city of great wealth in Jesus' time. It was also called the City of Palms because of all the beautiful palm trees there. It was well watered. It had two great springs and a great aqueduct. It had a wall all around it with four massive forts on the wall. It had a great amphitheater built by King Herod, who had also built a new palace for himself there. It was also known for its magnificent gardens. It was an Eden-like place, a lot of wealth there. It was also a crossroads for travelers because people traveling from any direction had to pass through Jericho. So it was also a place where hundreds of thousands of Jews would pass through on their way to Jerusalem for the religious festivals. And since this is near Passover festival, it would have been packed with people on the day that Jesus was passing through. It says in verse two, behold, there was a man there named Zacchaeus and he was a chief tax collector and was rich. So although Jericho was beautiful, it also had a bit of an onerous reputation because it was one of three main tax collection centers in the land of Israel. People traveling through Jericho from any direction had to pay poll taxes in order to pass through. And people basically from age 15 onward could be taxed for everything, from their cards to the wheels on their cards to the goods they were carrying on the cards. And so tax collectors were not going to be popular among the people of the city or travelers. But tax collectors were also considered traitors because these were Jewish people who had purchased a tax franchise from the Romans. And if you had purchased one of these franchises, you basically could tax people whatever you wanted with no recourse. You had to pay Rome what it was due, but then you could charge whatever you wanted on top of that. And not only were tax collectors protected by Roman soldiers, but they also utilized thugs to strong-arm people and extort money from people. So it's kind of like the collectors in the mafia, very mafia-like, it's how you should see it. And it says Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector. He was at the top of the food chain, getting a percentage of all that the lower level, level tax collectors gathered. It's no wonder he was rich, and I'm sure he was not liked. But this life of sin and self-centeredness clearly wasn't satisfying him because something deep within him drew him to Jesus. Verse three, he was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, but he was about to pass that way. So Zacchaeus wants to check out Jesus, but there's a problem. There are thousands of pilgrims filling Jericho and there's this great buzz around Jesus because of all of his miracles and his three years of ministry. And so everybody wants to see him and Zacchaeus can't see over their heads because he's a wee little man. You know, some experts say that the average height at this time in history was 5'1". Others say it was around 5'7". And he was short for that. He was a small guy. And so when he hears that Jesus is coming by, he does something very out of character for someone like him. He climbs a sycamore fig tree to see him. Now these trees had branches that spread out close to the ground. And commentators point out that this would have been a surprising move for someone as well known and notorious as Zacchaeus to publicly climb a tree like a kid would. They also point out that he is, in some sense, fulfilling the words of Jesus, which are spoken in Matthew 18.3, when Jesus said, 
truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never see the kingdom of heaven. But this humiliating, bold move by Zacchaeus pays off. In verse five, it says, when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So every traveler traveling through Jewish villages and towns would need somewhere to stay on their journey. And opening your home to travelers was a huge part of Jewish hospitality. It was kind of an expected thing. And so it would have been an honor for anyone to open their home to someone as famous as Jesus as a house guest. Now, normally, hospitality would be offered to people like this without them having to ask for it. But when Jesus sees the steps that Zacchaeus has already taken to see him, he sees him perched in that tree, the Holy Spirit pings Jesus. And he commands Zacchaeus to come down and receive him as a house guest. Notice the word must. He says, I must stay at your house. Jesus is saying, this is something that must happen because God has ordained this moment to take place. Now, though Zacchaeus was by no means a righteous man who cared about obeying the commands of God, when Jesus commands him to come down, he obeys right away. Boy, this is a great picture of how we ought to live. When Jesus tells us to move, we ought to obey right away. When the word of God tells us to do something, we ought to obey right away. When the Holy Spirit prompts us, when we hear something in worship that God's communicating to us, obedience must follow the prompting because blessing lies on the other side of obedience. God does amazing things on the other side of our obedience to his commands and his promptings. So it says in verse six, Zacchaeus hurried and came down and received Jesus joyfully. Zacchaeus is more than happy to leave his perch and he happily leads Jesus back to his home for an evening of rest and refreshment. But this didn't make everyone happy. Verse seven says, when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And this is interesting because we read in other places that the Jewish religious leaders who thought they were righteous would grumble about the people that Jesus was hanging out with. They didn't like it when he hung out with tax collectors or sinners. But here it says, they all grumbled, meaning everybody who saw this was unhappy about this. And you can imagine why. This guy Zacchaeus is the head of a corrupt and exploitative tax practice, which is harming the people of the region. Everybody would probably hate Zacchaeus, and he obviously didn't have any regard for the well-being of others. But this is the guy that Jesus chooses to honor by going to his home. And it happens. Jesus, the apostles, they go spend the evening with Zacchaeus. And at some point in the evening, Zacchaeus decides he'd rather have Jesus. He'd rather have the light of the Lord than any of the wealth that he has. Check this out. Verse 8. Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will restore it fourfold. Now, there's a lot going on here. First, notice Zacchaeus' confession that Jesus is Lord. This is the most important confession that anyone can make with their lips. As it says in Romans 10, 9, if we confess with our lips that Jesus is Lord, and we believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. Over the centuries, Christians would be slaughtered for refusing to declare that Caesar was Lord because they were instead declaring that Jesus is Lord. This is a confession of faith and submission of Zacchaeus to Jesus. Notice also the repentance that takes place. Zacchaeus says if he's wronged anyone, he'll pay him back fourfold. Now, Old Testament law required people to make restitution by paying one-fifth of the amount taken by fraud to anyone they had wronged. Fourfold restitution was only required if an animal was stolen and killed. But Zacchaeus pledges to pay back fourfold anyone he has defrauded, which would have been a lot of people. He also pledges to give half of all his possessions to the poor. Friends, this 
is what salvation looks like when it hits a person. This is what genuine repentance looks like. There's no mention of Jesus commanding Zacchaeus to do this. Zacchaeus has been exposed to the presence, the light, and the love of God, and he judges himself. The light has shined upon his life. He knows what he's done wrong, and he chooses to make it right. He repents. He embraces Jesus and the abundant life that Jesus offers. Verse 9, and Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house since he also is a son of Abraham. Jesus confirms that Zacchaeus has truly experienced the grace of God, been saved from his idolatry, been saved from his sin, been set free. Zacchaeus chose to overthrow the idols of greed and selfishness and the idol of money. He topples those false gods over and he makes Jesus the Lord of his house. And Jesus confirms that Zacchaeus has demonstrated he's not just a Jew by birth, but he is a spiritual son of Father Abraham, the father of the faithful. Now commentators also note that Jesus didn't just say salvation has come to this man. He said salvation has come to this house. This seems to indicate that other members of Zacchaeus' household were also touched by the Holy Spirit and experienced salvation that day. You know, this is what happens quite often. Someone in a house feels called to come and worship Jesus. Then other members come along, and then the house goes from being an agnostic or indifferent house to be a house filled with happy Christians serving the Lord. In verse 10, Jesus explains what he was up to the whole time with this visit to Zacchaeus. He said in verse 10, for the son of man came to seek and save the lost. When Jesus refers to the son of man, this is a title for the Messiah. And he's speaking of himself as the Messiah in third person here. And anyone who is receptive would understand that he was giving away the fact that he is the son of man of the Old Testament. He is the Messiah. And he says why this Messiah came. Why did the Messiah leave heaven above? Jesus said he came to seek and to save the lost. This is critical to understand about the ministry of Jesus. Jesus did not come just to deliver a set of ethical teachings. He came to go after people far from God, bring them home to God, and die on the cross to pay for their sins. This is why churches need to be relentlessly focused on seeking and saving lost people. Churches that don't have this as a primary focus are terribly out of sync with the heartbeat of heaven. They aren't bringing heaven the joy that they're meant to bring. Jesus said there's more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who don't need repentance. This is why as hard as it is to keep focusing on evangelism and helping our unchurched neighbors become Christians, we cannot give up. We cannot throw in the towel. We must keep pushing ourselves and challenging ourselves. This is why we're going to do something new, try something new this fall. In addition to continually inviting people to join us to meet with Jesus together on Sunday morning, I'm asking you to prayerfully consider hosting a home group to go through this fall study, Christian to the Core. Uh, and so this is a way that many people are reaching people all over the world. They're reaching people who aren't ready to return to church. They start this house group and then they keep it open so they can always bring in more people. If the house group gets too big, they split off and start another one that's built into it. This is an evangelism tool. And there are probably thousands of people in our neighborhoods who aren't ready to ascend Sunday morning worship yet, but would be curious enough to come to a small group in our homes if we invited them. So I want to invite everyone to scan the QR code that you will see on the screen. And you can go ahead, do that, and then download the Christian to the Core book for free. And as you do that, this will show up, and you can click on the Adult Workbook tab, and then you can download the Christian to the Core book. If you go to page 21 in that, 
then you'll be able to read through the way group lessons are organized and how to lead them. We're also going to have a couple of training sessions for people who want to lead one of these groups. We're going to have a training session here at the church on August 11th at 11.15 and another one on August 13th at 6.30 p.m. And so we can talk through how to lead one of these groups. We can also meet with you individually. Leslie can meet with you, walk through how to lead one of these groups. My wife and I are planning on hosting our own home group on Sunday evenings. And I hope that you'll really consider whether you might be called to do this. So let me give some closing thoughts from this story of Jesus and the wee little man. Number one is this, what seems is possible is not impossible with God. What seems impossible is not impossible with God. You know, people are quick to know that the story of Zacchaeus comes shortly after the story of the rich young ruler found in Luke chapter 18. The rich young ruler who came to Jesus and asked him how to inherit eternal life. And Jesus told him he needed to keep the commandments. The man said he'd been doing that since his youth. And then Jesus said, one thing you lack, sell all that you have, give to the poor and come follow me. Jesus looked at the young rich man's heart, saw there was idolatry there, saw that he needed to liquidate that for him to follow Jesus. Jesus was calling him to be an apostle or be a disciple of his. But the rich man couldn't walk away from his wealth. And it says in Luke chapter 18, verse 24, Jesus looked at him and said, how hard it is for the rich man to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. And those who heard asked, well, then who can be saved? And Jesus replied, what is impossible with man is possible with God. The disciples thought that this man's wealth was a sign that he was living in God's favor. They thought it was a sign that this guy who kept the commandments was supremely blessed by God. And yet he couldn't leave his wealth to follow Jesus. If he couldn't be saved, who could be saved? They thought this man looked like a righteous man. Jesus says it's nearly impossible for those addicted to wealth to overthrow that idol and become followers of Jesus and be saved. He said it's almost impossible but with, with God, it is possible. And then he demonstrates that. Jesus goes to Jericho and showed everyone that it was possible. He saved Zacchaeus, not only very rich, but also very sinful. You see, Jesus is seeking and saving absolutely everyone. Jesus is going after rich and poor alike. He's going after atheists, agnostics, Hindus, Buddhists, Muslims, Jews. He's going after drug addicts and gangsters. He's also going after nice middle-class people in our neighborhoods who may be indifferent to the things of God. He's going after all of them. Anyone who comes to your mind, no matter how hardened they may seem, it is absolutely possible for Jesus to reach them and save them. We shouldn't count anybody out. We should pray for those who seem the furthest from God because what's impossible with man is possible with God. Jesus demonstrates that with Zacchaeus. Second thought is this, it's that the salvation of individuals is good for everyone. The people of Jericho were understandably disgruntled when Jesus overlooked all of them and went to the home of this notorious chief tax collector who was making their lives miserable. But the next day when Zacchaeus started splitting his possessions with the poor and sending out the massive tax refund checks of the people he defrauded, I'm sure at that point they were glad that Jesus chose to go to his house over theirs. You know, one of the most encouraging parts of going on the recent mission trip to Guatemala for me was getting to know and spend time with a guy named Pastor Stuart Nice. Pastor Stuart is a former marijuana dealer who came to Christ during the Jesus movement. Several years ago, he planted a church in Simi Valley in California, and he's been there ever since. Although his church is small, only has about 50 people, he also started a Christian school, which has had a significant role in the community. But for over 20 years, Pastor Stewart and the people from his little church have been traveling to Antigua, Guatemala to minister to the people in the poverty-filled villages around the city. 
and the cumulative impact of people from his small church going back year after year has been incredibly significant for hundreds of people. And people from our church have just been going on these trips for a few years with him, uh, spurred on by Ann Spore, who got connected with the ministry uh, years ago. But he sent out an update this week of the results of the time that we spent in mission there. He said, during the last two weeks that we were there, he said, we distributed over 3,120 pounds of clothing, built two homes, installed 25 fresh water tanks, installed one new roof, engaged 200 children and parents in VBS activities. You see, when salvation came to Stuart, the drug dealer in California, not only was his soul saved from addiction, saved from hell, but he began to bless others. His small slice of people in California that he has blessed, all the children that have gone through their Christian school, and hundreds of people living in poverty in Guatemala have been blessed too. You see, when we talk about reaching people for Christ, it's not just so that their souls may be saved, though that's no small thing, but Christ will then use them to bless countless others as well. What the world needs more than ever is for more people to get truly saved through Jesus Christ, just as Zacchaeus was, just as Pastor Stewart was. The third and closing thought is this, is that today is a great day to choose Jesus as Lord. Notice that Jesus said to Zacchaeus in verse five, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. And in verse nine, he said, today salvation has come to this house. Maybe you've never had a day of true repentance like Zacchaeus had, a day when you decided to truly respond to the Lord, make him the Lord of your life, even if it resulted in big lifestyle changes about your finances, your future, or your sex life. A day when you decided that Jesus is more important than everything else and living in friendship with him is better than everything else. Is today your today? Let's pray. God, I thank you that you've given us today. Today to consider and take stock of what we're doing with our lives. Lord, are we a truly living lives of repentance and generosity like Zacchaeus? Are we truly seeking to reach, to seek and save the lost? God, I pray that you would grant true repentance to every person listening to this. Lord, I pray that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit. Help us let go of anything that would hinder us from following you with abandon. And now we pray the prayer that Jesus taught as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For that is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Now let us declare together what we believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.